you again this over the course of this weekend. Um, Friday night's attendance was quite extraordinary, and the um, barbecue was even more extraordinary than my presentation, for sure. That was, stole the show, in my opinion. Um, and then yesterday was great, and I would appreciate those of you who were able to make the commitment to come out and spend a Saturday morning when it was an absolutely gorgeous day. Um, and hopefully I made your morning not too wasted and it was worthwhile. Um, it's great now to have this time to teach in Bible class. This is the thing I like to do the best. Um, I tell people preaching's all right, but I really like to teach. And I consider myself a much better teacher than preacher. I, I get by with preaching, but I like to teach. And so um, that's what I'm going to be doing here now. Um, I read a book just recently on the Acts of the Apostles that kind of blew my mind. It was a really good book, not an easy one, so that's why I'm not going to tell you about it, because they do untranslated German and that kind of stuff in it, and lots of Greek, so you don't probably care. But um, the book really made me rethink what was going on in the Acts of the Apostles. And so when the reading for the first, you know, the first reading in, in Easter is always from the Acts, I'm hearing this kind of in new ways, and I wanted to share some of this with you from Acts chapter 10. Uh, I also have an alternate Bible class I was maybe going to do, which if I can pull it off, maybe I'll wing some of that in at the end. So that means we have to really move fast through this first part, which I'm not known for, but we'll see how it goes. All right? So we are in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 to 48, and this is the last half of Acts 10. Acts chapter 10 is 48 entire verses to one story, and it's a big deal. And when you have something committed to a big story, lots of verses to it, there's something going on here. Now remember about Acts, just the setup. Acts is volume two of Luke's two-volume story of Jesus and his church. So the Gospel of Luke, Luke wrote as an account of Christ and all that he did. Luke did his research, he found out stuff, and then the Acts of the Apostles continues that story, and it picks it right up there. And if you read the first few verses of Acts, it's just like, hey, I told you about Jesus, now here comes the second part of the story, let me tell you about how the church grew. And the Acts of the Apostles is fascinating because Luke was most likely an eyewitness to much of it. He was a traveling companion for Paul, joined Paul in some of his travels, and saw what was going on, so he wrote the stuff down, so it's kind of of interesting. <clears throat> now, so what Luke is doing in the Acts of the Apostles is he's telling the story of the growth of the church, how it goes from Jesus crucified and risen and 11 men left hanging on, hiding in fear, to becoming this church that is now spreading all over the, church, all over the world and unbeknownst to Luke, who of course would die in the first century, within three centuries beats Rome. And so we can't forget this. This is, this is the thing that just blows your mind. It starts in Palestine with, you know, 11 guys who are terrified because Jesus has been crucified. And in 300 years, you've got the Roman emperor saying, okay, Christianity wins. I'm on their side. you got to be kidding. It's, you, the three, it's, un, it's unbelievable. It's just that... Pilate could have never dreamed such a thing would happen, and yet it does. The apostles couldn't have dreamed it. So you see God's hand in this. So what Paul, Luke is doing is he's unfolding the story. And in chapter 10, there is a huge jump forward in the story. You know, the first big event is the Pentecost story. Chapter 2, you'll hear that in a couple of weeks when on Pentecost Sunday. And then you have the church kind of growing out. And the, the outline of, Luke, of Luke's work in Acts is very simple. From Jerusalem to all Judea, to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly how the story unfolds. Starts in Jerusalem with Pentecost, moves out into Judea, and you've got Philip in encountering the, the Ethiopian. It brings out, move up into Samaria, and then it gets out to the coast, to Caesarea, and then you have Paul's to the whole world, and that's how the story of Acts unfolds. Chapter 10 is a big deal. Because chapter 10 is the big leap forward from the church being simply another form of Judaism to actually letting in Gentiles, which kind of matters to most of you in this room, okay? It's kind of a big deal. And this was enormous. And we, can, we cannot even grasp how big a deal this is because we're just so used to this. And, you know, the church is Gentiles now, and the Jews are the kind of the, the odd ones, but when it started to become a Christian meant you were coming out of Judaism. Jesus was a Jew, all the apostles were, and they were fulfilling Judaism, and so Gentiles always had a funny relationship to Jews, and that's evident in the Acts of the Apostles, and that's part of the setup here. I'm trying to cover this quickly, because the Jews were all about your birth, 
You were born a Jew. You practice this Jewish faith. If you are a Gentile, not born into the Jewish faith and then to the Jewish culture, you could worship with the Jews, but there were two levels of your involvement. One was you were a a believer or a God-fearer is what they would call you. That meant that you kind of believed the things the Jews believed. You believed in Yahweh. You believed in his law. You went to the synagogue. You would participate, but you weren't really in. You would have to stay by the gate and listen in from outside behind the screen. You couldn't go into the temple, into the part where the Jewish believers went, even though you believed what they believed. Just believing it didn't matter. You had to become a keeper of the law if you were going to be allowed to come to the next step. The next step was a proselyte. And a proselyte was someone who not only believed and confessed what this Jewish stuff believed, but he actually started to keep the laws of Israel. And for a man, what did that mean? Circumcision. Yeah, we'll have to go to there. It's kind of one of those delicate topics, to say the least. But this was the big deal. If you were going to become a full Jew, you had to become a Jewish law keeper. You would have to keep kosher in your home. You would have to be circumcised. You would do everything else. And then you were a proselyte to the faith. But guess what? You weren't ever really a real full blast Jew. You were just a kind of a, we'll let you in, a proselyte. And you always remained a proselyte. That's how it was in Judaism. So when the church started to grow and they started to tell the gospel out to other people, the question was always, where do these non-Jews fit? Do they even belong? And a lot of people in Jesus' day had no use for Gentiles. In fact, it was taught among some of the rabbis, Gentiles were created to fuel the fires of hell. Thank God for that. And that was it. They had no use for any Gentile. So the idea of a Gentile coming in, can't believe it. So this is the setting for, for Acts chapter 10, because the early converts to the, to the church were all Jews. All that Pentecost people, 5,000 men and women, or 3,000, I forget the exact how many thousand, on a single day, they were all Jews, or all people who had converted into Judaism, the proselytes at least, because they're all coming to Israel, they're all coming to Jerusalem to worship for the festivals. So they're Jewish people. And so they're all converts to the Christian faith out of Judaism. And everybody's like, cool, good, yeah. So what did the Christians do? They kept kosher. They kept their Jewish ways of living. They still worshiped on Saturday. And now they worship Jesus. That's what they were doing. That's how it all worked. So chapter 10 is significant. And chapter 10, and we don't have time to read the whole entire story. If we... If I was going to have weeks to do this, we would read this and unpack it as we go. But the whole story of Acts chapter 10 unfolds for us, and I can got it down here for us. Here we go. And it starts off with this vision of a man in, in Caesarea. Now, where is Caesarea? Caesarea, I've got a map here for you so you can get your bearings. There we go. Caesarea is in Judea, all right? So here's the map of the Holy Land. You guys are familiar with that. To give you your bearings, here's Jerusalem, okay? You know where that is, right? Here, I'll get my pen to work. No, I won't. So Jerusalem, look closely, you'll see it. Okay, there, I'll dot on it. Maybe that'll work. No, that's not working either. All right, so there's Jerusalem. And then in the north is Galilee. Galilee, of course, would be where Jesus was hanging out. Here's the Sea of Galilee up here. Here's Nazareth. And then on the coast, over here in this by the sea, you see the plain of Sharon, and you see Caesarea. Caesarea is where the church kind of just really kind of started to take off. And then down here is this little place called Joppa. That's going to come into um, relevance soon as well. And you notice that between Caesarea and Joppa, according to our scale of miles, is about 25 miles. So about the distance between Marathon and Athens. We'll learn more about that in the sermon. All right. <clears throat> So we have that, that's where this is going on. So there's this guy named Cornelius, and it says, just to introduce you to Cornelius, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. Now that's a big deal. The Italian cohort was part of the Roman army, and they were Italian Romans. They're not just like Persians or Greeks who had been impressed into service. These are the real deal. These are Italians, and they were made up of volunteers to the army. They weren't conscripted. So these were considered the most loyal of Caesar's soldiers. And they had several different cohorts in this legion, a couple legions, and they were stationed at key places around the empire. So that's who Cornelius is, and he is a centurion, which means he's in charge of how many guys? A hundred. 
theoretically. It moved around, but that was the idea. That's where centurion comes from, from the idea of century. So Cornelius is a big shot in the Roman army. He's a real Roman. He's an Italian Roman. And it says he is one who feared God with all his household. Oh, it starts working. Thank you. So he feared God with all his household. So what does it mean that he fears God? He's in that first category of Jewish kind of interested people. When he fears God, he believes in Yahweh. He believes that Moses is giving us the true law, but he's not all the way into the proselyte thing yet, or it would have said it. He's just kind of in that first level in. He's a God-fearer, and all his household. Now, in the Greek world, household meant what? Everybody under your roof. And the roof was not just a little building. It was usually a courtyard. So this included your kids, your grandkids, your uncle who was visiting, and maybe your servants and any of them else. So a household could be a couple dozen people. And it was everybody who was connected to Cornelius. So all his household is there. So this probably says something about Cornelius and his influence. He is, after all, a centurion, and he's saying, I think this God of Israel is important. Everybody around Cornelius says, all right, we'll listen. And they're all in this together. So he is giving alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. He's a devout man. He is a man who is listening to God. And then he has this vision, and I don't have time for it, now to go into the details. He has a vision, and God shows him a man named Simon who is going to come and visit him, who is down in Joppa. And so he has this vision, and Cornelius comes out of the vision and says, all right, I need someone to go to Joppa right away, 25 miles south, and I want you to find this guy named Peter, and Simon Peter, he's staying in the house of a guy named Simon, and he's a tanner, and it's by the sea which is meant to tell you where to find it. You didn't have MapQuest. You couldn't look him up. So he's just supposed to go to Joppa and find a guy named Peter. All right, good luck with that. Well, you find a house of a guy named Simon, and he's by the sea. You'll find him. So Cornelius sends some of his most trusted men, three of them, off they go heading to Joppa. Meanwhile, while they're traveling south, as the story unfolds, it says, meanwhile, now Peter was um, having a vision himself. And so Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray on the next day when they're on their way approaching the city. And so you have the delegation coming down from Caesarea, from, from Cornelius, and Peter is up on the roof and he's praying. And it's about noon. And it says he has a vision because he's getting a little hungry. Maybe he's having a hunger vision. But he even says, hey, I want something to eat. So they're getting the meal ready. And while they're cooking the meal, while he's up on the roof, he has a vision. And you guys are familiar with this one. This is the sheet, a big sheet, full of these unclean animals, crustaceans and, you know, lizards and things that you can't eat if you're a Jew, pigs and all kinds of other unclean animals. They're all in this sheet. And the sheet gets lowered down in front of Peter. And Peter is told, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. And Peter says, oh, no way. No, no, I keep kosher. I am a good Jew. I don't touch that stuff. And then the voice says, don't you call unclean what I call clean. And so the vision happens three times. And this is significant. How many three times does Peter have in his life? You know? You think Peter should be paying attention here, you know? And so <clears throat> there's three times you're going to deny me. Oh, no, I won't. Well, he does. And then three times, do you love me? And he gets reasserted. And so these three is a kind of a big deal for Peter. Peter apparently is a slow learner. Um, it takes him a little while to get it. So by the third time, though, the message has gotten through Peter's thick skull. And so he's learned, don't call unclean what I call clean. So Peter's up there thinking, hmm, does that mean I should have lizard for lunch? What's going on here? And at that very moment, just as the vision wraps up, there's a knock on the courtyard door, and three guys from Caesarea, soldiers in the Roman army, say, hey, we're looking for a guy named Peter. We're told he might be here at your house. And so Simon the Tanner says, yeah, up there. And so up they go, and they meet Peter, and they say to Peter, we had a message to send to you from a guy named Cornelius. He's told us to come and find you. You're supposed to come with us, and we need you to come back to Caesarea because you have a message for us. That's what our master told us. So what's Peter's response? This is where it gets cool. Peter invites them in, and they all have their meal together. Now, already, this is a big deal because who's Peter eating with? A bunch of Gentiles. You don't do that. 
You do not do that. Peter's doing it. He invites him right into Simon's home. This is already like, whoa, this is a new thing. And it is not a small thing, because now you have a Jew sitting down, inviting people into your house and feeding them. And then they tell the story. Peter says, all right, let's go. We'll get moving. We'll do this. So they head out that very day, and Peter brings with him a delegation of six guys from Joppa, probably who are just curious as all get out about what's going on. And who are these six people from Joppa? They would have just been Jewish Christians from the church there is getting started in Joppa, and they were just kind of tagging along with Peter to see what this was all about. That's what happens. So it takes a while to get up there. Peter's not as spry probably as the other delegation. So overnight they travel, and they travel, and they get the 25 miles back, and now we're to the fourth day since the first vision. And now Peter and his delegation, the three from Cornelius, his six, all ten of them are rolling on into Caesarea, and they're ready to try to find Cornelius, and they arrive at the house of Cornelius. And that's about where we're ready to pick up our story. But we've got one more stage in this, and this is while the delegation is gone, trying to find Peter and bringing him back. Cornelius has been busy, and he has invited all of his extended family and all of his friends, and they're all at the house waiting for Peter to show up. He knew how long it was going to take. He probably calculated, well, they're going to be back by about 3 o'clock, be here, and so they're there. And so then Peter comes into the house of Cornelius, and he enters the house, another significant thing, and Cornelius comes out to meet him and says, hey, I'm so glad you're here. You had this vision. I had this vision. This is pretty exciting. What do you got to say to us? Come on in and tell us. And so he opens the door, and Peter walks into a group of people, maybe this many, all shoved into Cornelius' house. So there's probably dozens of people, maybe close to, you know, 40, 50 people all there. So Peter has instant audience. He's there to preach. And that's where our text finally gets going here. And we are in then verse 30. Yeah, well, yeah, verse 34. Let me find it here on my handout for us. All right, so verse 34, we finally get to where we're going. So we have, so I sent for you immediately and have been kind enough to come. Now then we are all here present before God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So we're your captive audience. Preach. So what does Peter do? He preaches. Opening his mouth, Peter, which is code for here comes a really important speech, Okay. Peter said, I most certainly understand now. And I'm using um, New American Standard Bible, okay, NASB. And I use that because I like the literalness of it. All right, so New American Standard. I most un- certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him, that means has trusts him as his Lord, fears him, and does what is right, is welcome to him. And what is right is to confess him as Lord and God. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed. Now, if you're paying attention to the English of verses 36 and 37, it's clumsy English. It doesn't work real well. And the the ESV that you will hear in church in the service that you already heard cleans it up and has to kind of play games with the grammar a little bit in the Greek to make it work because the Greek grammar is clumsy as it reads because it reads just the way my translation has it. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, parentheses, he is Lord of all, You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't follow. This is what we call in Greek an analokuthen. There's a break in the logic. Something's not right. But part of the problem is the translators are struggling with what to do with this translation, frankly. And they're having a hard time. They're struggling. with. Oh, you guys want to fill in blanks. i got to back up a minute. I'm sorry. i got to pay attention where I am. I know this is important. What does it mean to do right? It means to unbelieve God. Okay? So believe God and follow his commands, all right? And it's all in the context of the individual before God. So in other words, when they're told that Cornelius does right, it's not that he's earning God's favor by being a great guy and giving lots of money. He is showing that he is trusting God, and he is, in a sense, then before God, repentant. And that's the key thing. So that's what makes him right before God. Now, back onto where I at. Most English translations miss 
the power of verse 36. And they're missing it because they're kind of struggling with how to actually translate this. Because it says in Greek, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel. Now the key is this idea of the word. Because the word can mean the message, the speech. But the word can also mean what? Jesus. Halagos, the Word made flesh, the Word, and I believe that's exactly what's going on here. So in other words, the Word which God sent to the sons of Israel, the Word being His own Son, His own Son, He came to the sons of Israel, and what did He do? He was preaching peace through Jesus Christ, and He, the Word, is Lord of all. That's not a parenthesis throwaway that Peter says, oh, by the way, he's Lord of all. That's the big point. This is the big deal. This Jesus, this word that God sent, the God the Father himself sent this word to the people of Israel. And he ran around Judea. He did this. And he came preaching the good news of peace with God, which is what everybody's looking for. He is Lord. That's the big deal of the verse. It's not a parenthesis throwaway. It's the whole point. You see, we can't miss how big a deal this is. Jesus looks like he's another teacher. He looks like he's just doing ordinary stuff, and he's teaching this radical message. What happens to him? He gets killed. He's done, but he's not done. The whole point of Easter is God says, "Uh uh-uh. He's not staying dead because he is Preaching, preaching truth. Everything he said is true. God vindicates him by raising him. And so he is Lord because God makes him Lord. And because he is Lord, that means he's in charge of everything. He is the supreme Lord. He is God himself. That's huge. And that's what I'm saying over here when I say this is doubly potent. The fact that he is Lord. That's the kicker here. He is Lord. And why is it doubly potent? Well, for the Greeks, or for the Romans, more accurately here, the Gentiles. Greeks is what the Jews always called every Gentile. You're all Greeks. What does that mean? Jesus is Lord? What's the implication for the Romans? What's the implication for for Cornelius to hear Jesus is Lord? Who does Cornelius say is Lord all the time? Caesar. And not Caesar. That's the big deal. And this is the key all through the Acts of the Apostles. Jesus is Lord, Caesar's not. Caesar's not in charge, Jesus is. Jesus is Lord, Caesar is nothing. That's a big deal to the Romans. Jesus is Lord? Okay? Now, what about to the Jews? What's the big deal about saying Jesus is Lord? Wow, it's even more than Messiah. Okay, Messiah means the anointed one that God sent to do his work. When you say Jesus is Lord, Lord is the Greek translation, the Latin translation, the English translation of the Hebrew word that nobody can say, Yahweh. He is Yahweh. That's a big deal. That's the kind of stuff that makes a Jew catch his breath. Jesus is Yahweh? What? Yahweh's flesh and blood? What? That's the point. And so for the Jews, Jesus is Yahweh. He is, I'm sorry, I put Hebrew up here. You'll figure it out, okay? (laughs) Jesus is Yahweh. He is Lord. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. That's who he is. So this is doubly potent. There's nothing throwaway or tangential or parenthetical about Jesus is Lord. This is a huge statement of faith. It's the first confession of the Christian church. And, that's, and we need to think about what that actually means. Is Jesus actually Lord today? Do we live like it? Or do we live like America is Lord? Or do we live like our boss is Lord? Or like our retirement account is Lord? Who's Lord? Who's calling the shots? Who's really in charge? So this is the big deal. And so the question then is, how is this still the central Christian confession? This is the core of what we confess as Christian people. He is Lord. The implications of this are stunning. Because if you really believe Jesus is Lord, it's going to impact how you live. 
It's going to make a difference in how you see life and where you fit and what's going on and what the point of the church is. The point of the church is to make sure everybody else knows he's Lord. And we should live this way. We as Christians live weird lives because we live like Jesus is Lord, not the stuff of the world. That's the big deal. So this still matters. It still matters, and it still impacts how we live. A lot of Christians have gotten just so complacent with the Christian message and have kind of dropped the ball on the Lordship of Christ, frankly. Because if He's your Lord, He's the one who tells you how to spend your money, how to live, how to drive your car, what kind of car to drive, where to buy a house, everything. Everything. And too many Christians, especially in America, are comfortable with their busy, happy, fat, nice lives, and they just find a little spot, and they shove Jesus into that on Sunday morning. There, there's my spiritual part. I'm not a Muslim. Nope. I'm not an atheist. I believe in Jesus. Got that. Now I'm going to go back to my busy life. That's not the Christian life. That's not Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord means he runs everything. All 24 hours of all seven days of every week of your entire life, he's Lord. How many Christians are really in, on board with that? That's challenging. And that's what's going on here. And see, that's what's happening in the Acts of the Apostles is this message is getting out, that Jesus is Lord. And that's, that's what makes the difference for the disciples. How can they go from cowering in terror, you know, hiding in the upper room, to being out there preaching the gospel? And who cares what anybody thinks? What's driving them? He's alive. He's Lord. What do you mean? How can we not? Kill me if you want. I don't care. Jesus is Lord. What difference does it make? Jesus is Lord. There was that movie a year ago or so, and I forget the even title. I think it was Risen, and it was, you know, it was fairly well done. And it was a story about Jesus rising and the impact on the disciples. And if you see that, it made it around through theaters. The one part I liked about that, about that movie a lot was, I think it was Thaddeus, one of the apostles. He was being dragged in front of the Roman who was interviewing people, and he just had this kind of goofy response. It's like, he's alive. You know, who cares? You do what you want to me. I, it, he's alive. What am I supposed to do? And it, it, they got that just right. You know, the impact of Jesus is Lord just transforms everything. What else matters? If he is really Lord, what else, what else counts? That's all that matters. So this is what's really awesome about this. So this is what Peter's preaching. So Peter's preaching this one that was sent by God, God the Father sent this word into Israel, and he preached, he's Lord. And then he continues with his little sermon here to the people. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea. And the thing means all the ministry of Jesus. And everybody has heard about this. So Peter assumes everybody has heard. He knows they have. Starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. How God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? When did God anoint him with the Holy Spirit? At the baptism. See, that's where we have this tying in. With power and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. All of this, everybody in the audience knows. And he's just retelling the story and helping to remember this. And now here comes the kicker. The, and notice the contrast here, too. I want you not to miss this. So we have the story he's telling here. God anointed him. God sent him. Okay? He is, God sent him. He sent him. God sent him. God anointed him. God was with him. We are witnesses of these things. And then, what? It's in the contrast, they put him to death. So now we have this great contrast, okay? So we have the contrast between what God does, choosing Jesus and sending Jesus and working through Jesus. So God's doing this. God is choosing and sending and working through Jesus of Nazareth. And then what do they do? And Peter doesn't even name who the they is. What do they do? They kill him, Okay. What a contrast. So God has chosen Jesus. God has designated Jesus. God is working through Jesus. God has made Jesus his chosen servant. And what do the, the people do? Kill him off. What a contrast. This is what the world does. God comes to the world bringing peace, speaking the gospel, speaking new life. And what's the world do? Kill. We don't want it. No, we'll do it our way. We don't want you to be our Lord. We'll be our own Lord. Get out of the way. 
We kill him. And you see, and you hear it like that, you think, well, that's exactly how it goes down. Exactly how it goes down. And then the kicker, though. And here's the center of the whole message, and here it comes. Verse 40. God raised him up on the third day. Ha! <laughs> God won't let him stay dead. God raises him. Now, see, this is significant. Why is God raising Jesus? Well, Jesus is God. Why is he going to raise himself? Well, the Bible talks both ways. Why is Peter zeroing in on God raising him here? What's the big deal there? Why is Peter emphasizing this? What do you think? What's the point? He's accepting the sacrifice. It's the validation. It's the affirmation. God won't let him stay dead. God sees what happens and God raises his Messiah. God raises his son. This is the affirmation that God himself has done it. Jesus doesn't um, assert his own authority. He is always asserting the Father's authority. So the Father validates him. And so God raised him up on the third day, granted that it becomes visible, not to all the people, so Jesus isn't parading around Jerusalem, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. And who are those witnesses? Well, that's us. And who does Peter mean by the us? Himself and the 11, the other 11, and then, of course, the new 12th one, Matthias, who gets rolled in there as well. And what did we do? Who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And the words here for ate and drank are interesting because they imply kind of an ongoing sort of a thing. So it's not like Jesus just showed up a couple of times that we have in the Bible. Most likely, Jesus was appearing to the 12 frequently during those 40 days, and spending time with them. And they would even eat and drink and share meals with him. We know about one time in Galilee where he was making the breakfast for them, and they had breakfast with him. So this is what they were doing. They are spending time with him. They know he's alive. And then what did he, now Jesus, order us to do? Preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed as, by God as what? Judge of the living and the dead. He's Lord. He has authority. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now what's the significance of everyone? It's not just the Jews. It's not just the Jews. It's everyone. And so that's what's going on here. So this is the, the guts of Peter's speech. And he lays it all out, and they hear what this is all about, and they understand then the significance of this. So the, the critical point appears in verse 40, God raises Jesus. God's raising of Jesus. That's the critical point. G, oh, my JS with a line that's shorthand for Jesus. You all figured that out. All right. So do the question then, of course, that I've been stressing all morning here so far is, do we actually live like verse 42 is true. And that's for you to think about. Do you actually live like verse 42 is true? Verse 42 says, and that was where Peter's wrapping things up, um, God ordered us to preach to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. If you really believe that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead, what should that do to how you live? If you really believe he's the one who's going to hold you accountable, if you really believe he's the Lord, how should that impact what you do today and tomorrow and the next day? Does this matter? Does it have practical implications for life right now? Profound. Just profound implications. And that's the cool thing about what Peter's doing here. He's reminding us of what this actually means, and that's why he gets so excited. That's why this is such a big deal. All right. So that's the kind of the thing I want you to really consider is the impact of all this. Now, the result. What happens from all of this? Well, the cool thing now picks in with verse 44. So Peter is doing his little sermon, and probably what we get here in the about eight or so verses of his kind of truncated sermon is a summary of this. And then while Peter was still speaking these words, he hasn't said the amen to his sermon yet. He's still working on it. The Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter, they're the ones who came down from the, or came up from that city in Joppa, were amazed. Amazed. Why? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Wait a minute. 
You guys aren't supposed to get the Holy Spirit. That's for us. But they get it. And so the Jews are like, here we are in a Gentile house. That's weird enough. Here's Peter preaching to them. That's really strange. Here's Peter saying that this is for you. Whoa. Okay, Peter, this is pretty risky, pretty risky. So then what does God do? Sends down the Holy Spirit. And the people are now stunned. Because it's not just Peter, hey, I had a vision, trust me. But it's God himself validating this. So what happens? For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And we have a couple of the times in the Acts of the Apostles when there is this speaking in tongues. What's the first one we think about? Pentecost Day itself. And this was the apostles who are speaking in foreign languages, so everybody visiting Jerusalem gets to hear the gospel in their own language, in their own ears. Pretty cool. And the tongues clearly was a message from God that he is validating what these guys are saying. This is God's affirmation. So at Pentecost, the church begins with God's divine affirmation, and the tongues prove it. And now here in chapter 10, when we have Cornelius, who's not even a circumcised proselyte, he's just an interested Gentile, he and his whole household are hearing the gospel. What does the Holy Spirit do? He comes on them, and they're also speaking in tongues. And the people from Joppa go, whoa. This is God doing this. This is God's will. This is what God wants. Does God want these Gentiles invited in as part of the church, just like the Jewish believers? Yes. And this is the story that is so significant because now, not only is it a Jewish faith, but it just expands to everything. Everybody's included. Now it really is universal. Now it really is worldwide. That's the big deal here. So as I put it over here in my worksheet, you have essentially that God steps in and he finishes the sermon for Peter. And what a dramatic ending. You know, every preacher would wish God would do that. You know, you're preaching along and all of a sudden God gives a vision. Pretty cool. Listen to that. You know, I'll step back and you listen to God. And that's exactly what Peter's was happening here. So what's the point of the tongues? This is the validation of all that, Paul, all that Peter is saying. The validation of the message. And the point is that now even these Gentiles belong. So the Holy Spirit delivers two gifts. And the first one and the second one, the first one we've already encountered. The first one is what are they now doing? Well, they're speaking in tongues. That's gift one. And then we get gift two. Then Peter answered. So in other words, he's answering the Holy Spirit's activity. Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And Peter's question in the Greek is expecting a big, loud, resounding, of course not. So Peter says, should we baptize these people? And the immediate answer is, yeah, yeah. And when you baptize them, you're entering them in to the church. They're now part of this. So they're in. And he ordered, this would be Peter, ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how we're baptized, into the faith, into the church. And then they asked him to stay on for a few days. And he does. And he probably taught them a few more things and taught them what was going on. And they spent this time in fellowship. What an exciting story. And so... That's the second gift. What's the second gift? It's the baptism. So they are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's gift number two. So gift number one is the speaking in tongues, and gift number two is getting baptized. Which one's the bigger deal? Yes, you are good Lutheran people. So the greater one is the baptism. It's number two. That's the one that really counts. The lesser one is the tongues. The tongues is nice. The tongues is great because it affirms the validity of the story. And in the early church, these were affirmations that God needed, so everybody knew we were on track. But the greater thing is that they are baptized, and they are now in Christ. They now belong to him. They are fully in. So the huge, big takeaway from all this is the need to live and to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. All right. Questions or comments? Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, bleeding? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, um, that, yeah, it's a can of worms I don't want to open, but it's opened. Um, so we'll have to deal with it. And no, it's a good question, and it's, it's apparent here, and it needs to be dealt with. The answer is very, actually very strong and very simple. It's just I, it takes a little bit. Um, the Acts of the Apostles is descriptive, not prescriptive. We have to remember this. When you're reading stuff in anywhere in these 20-some verse chapters of Acts of the Apostles, Luke's telling us what happened. And because something happened once doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. There's a, it's a description. That's why I'm saying it's descriptive. This happened this time. So do we expect on Pentecost Sunday in a couple of weeks we're all going to speak in tongues and we're going to flames of fire? No, but we can remember what happened. And so to say it's prescriptive, we're kind of missing the point. So we have to be careful that we don't take something that happened and make a rule out of it. Like, well, see, look, they first believed and then they were baptized. There's the rule. You can't do that. You have to take other things, which um, would also say that, no, um, God is the one who claims us in baptism, and believing isn't necessary to have it happen first. And in fact, it's a choice that God is making. So we take other parts of Scripture and bring them in to get our full answer. Now, what I would also say then, the under part of your question is, well, what about believer's baptism? Well, the fundamental question here is, what's baptism anyway? Is baptism you making a promise to God, or is baptism God making a promise to you? Which one is it? First one or the second? It's the second. And so you have no part in it. God has the part in it. So that's why we baptize infants. Do infants have to know what's going on to receive God's gift? No. In fact, the less they know, the better off they are. (laughs) Because the more that you have a brain, it tends to get in the way. Oh, wait a minute. How can this be true? Do I really believe this? And see, it's actually harder for an adult to come to faith than as an infant. Which is why we baptize infants. It's how God intends it. So what God does, though, is he takes you where you are. So if you're an adult, he actually speaks to you as a whole person, and your mind gets involved, so the gospel is preached to you, you think about it, you receive it, but even as you're thinking about it and receiving it, who's doing all the work? We confessed it this morning in the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I cannot by my own reason or strength, but God calls me. God's doing the work. He's making it happen, right? He's bringing you in. And so an adult comes in, with his mind fully involved and fully engaged, that's why we teach, help him know what's happening, help him understand it, and then we baptize him after he's been taught. With an infant, there's not much you have to teach them. Um, they're not too receptive to teaching yet. And so we just baptize them, and then we teach them along. It's not like we've got different rules. We're just taking the person into account where they happen to be in their life, in their life cycle. Does that help? All right, good. Okay, so the question about why kosher laws in the Old Testament. This is part of the distinctiveness of the people of Israel. Um, and there's all kinds of questions about the, the um, moral code or even more the um, kind of the um, kosher code for Israel. What about all these rules about uncleans and all this kind of stuff? And some of the better, no one's really sure, frankly. But Hank, the better answer is part of this was just to keep people, people of Israel safe. Um, a lot of the unclean foods weren't healthy to eat in the ancient world. They weren't safe. And there's also the other side of it is God wants his people to be distinctive. They keep the Sabbath. They don't eat certain rule foods. They practice circumcision. They're distinctive, and they're, they're different. So that's part of the distinctiveness. And then the point is then Christ comes and fulfills all of that distinctiveness and then invites more. That's why the church, just five chapters later in Acts 15, has their first big council and tries to figure out, all right, how is this going to work? How much kosher do you have to keep? And the church comes to the conclusion, none. Basically, don't eat blood. We want you not to do that. And um, don't be um, practicing sexual immorality. And don't forget the poor. Other than that, you don't have to keep kosher. So Christ fulfills the Old Testament kosher laws. All right. Good. Anything else? It gives me five minutes to do my other topic, which is what I told my wife. Five minutes is not enough. But um, Um, you, you can have ten. Well, because I've got we, it. We often, we often take an extra five. Oh, do you? Okay. I'm not surprised to hear that. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. Well, so let's think about this a little bit. And I've been kind of pounding on this all morning, and you're going to hear more in the sermon if you haven't heard it already. And if you were here for first service, you're hearing a lot of continuity. All right? The need to live and proclaim Jesus is Lord. So what's this mean? That means Jesus is Lord and I'm not. Now, 
A huge part of uh, this that really kind of rankles at us that I kind of have discovered over the years in thinking about this is the whole question of where do rights fit in to the Christian life? Where do rights fit into the Christian life? And I was going to talk about this yesterday morning, but I didn't want to open that can of worms yesterday, so I didn't do it. But I'll do it now. And so where do rights fit in the Christian life? Rights, we know, are a fundamental thing of being American. We're all about rights. And we talk about human rights. And we talk about basic human rights. And we act like everybody knows there are these basic human rights. And we even have it enshrined in our Declaration of Independence. A right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But in John Locke's version, it's property. And Jefferson just tweaked it a little bit. Now, these are cherished ideals. And as I was stressing yesterday, these ideals are grounded in the Enlightenment. They're grounded in the Enlightenment, which is focused on me and individuals. The whole point of Enlightenment philosophy is every individual has inherent rights because they're alive, and then we yield some of those rights for the sake of government, and that's how we all learn to get along. That's not the Christian worldview. That's not the biblical worldview. In the biblical worldview, God is the creator and the Lord, and what are you? Creature. Your creature. Do creatures have rights before God? Imagine walking into God's presence. God, I'm here to claim my rights. And I could hear God saying, who gave you those rights? Well, I did. No. No. The only rights you have are the ones given to you. And you don't have rights. You see, in other words, just because you're a human being doesn't mean you have inherent rights. You don't. This is a myth created by the Enlightenment. Now, I know this is hard to swallow, but that's why I'm, I didn't want to give myself only five minutes. So let this just kind of sink in and, and trust me on this a little bit. Think about what Jesus says. You're supposed to go the second mile, turn the other cheek, give up everything you have. All that Sermon on the Mount stuff. How much rights talk is in there? See, Christians don't operate with this concept of rights, my rights, my rights. Christians operate with the concept of, I'm here to be God's servant to those around me. I don't claim rights. I have privileges given to me by my country, and I'll, I'm grateful for that. So the Bill of Rights, first ten amendments in the Constitution, that's great. So our country, when we got things pulled together, decided to extend these rights to human beings, wonderful. And so as an American, I can take advantage of those rights. But I also have an understanding that fundamentally, as a human being before God, I don't have rights. I have privileges granted to me by God. I have grace given to me abundantly in Jesus Christ. But grace is not a right. Do you have a right to God's grace? Do you have a right to the forgiveness of sins? Do you have a right to the Lord's Supper? Do you have a right to any of the mercy God extends to you? No. Rights talk is abhorrent to Christians. We don't think this way. And this is, again, part of what I was trying to illustrate yesterday, and most of you weren't here to hear this, but I'll say this here. We have to recognize that there are fundamental differences between being a good American and being a good Christian. For a long time in the history of the U.S., those two things were seemed to be kind of compatible, and we cut edges off of enough things when things got uncomfortable to make them fit together. But the reality is they don't fit real well together because the American experiment is founded on human enlightenment and the philosophy of Locke and Rousseau and Hobbes. That's what's driving it. The Christian worldview is driven by God revealed in Christ. So is Jesus Lord or is the Constitution Lord? Is Jesus Lord or is the will of the people Lord? In America, What's Lord? The will of the people. We the people. In the Christian faith, who's Lord? Jesus. Are they compatible? They can learn to get along. But it's not the Lord who gets along. It's the people who need to get along with him. So we need to be careful thinking about these things. And the implications are significant for us as individual persons. And if you stop to think about it, they're also kind of significant for how the church as the church operates in the world. There's a tendency right now among Christians who are feeling a little bit marginalized and a little bit fearful because they feel like they're getting kind of shoved out of the mainstream and kind of being pushed to the edges like we don't matter very much anymore. And a lot of Christians aren't taking that very kindly. We don't like it. 
And so there's a tendency among all Christians to start sort of pushing back. Hey, we've got rights too, and we're going to demand our rights. How come only the Muslims get rights? We want our rights too. I'm hearing this. It bothers me. It should bother you. Christians don't run around demanding their rights. We don't do that. We simply live the way Christ called us to live. And the message we make that makes the impact in the world is the fact that we don't play the game the world does. We don't go running around defending our rights and our turf. We simply do what God gave us to do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this so beautifully in one of his passages. He said, the space that the world claims in the the space that the church claims in the world is not to take over, but just enough space to be able to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. That's all we need. We don't need to have a lot of clout or a lot of privilege. We just need to be able to preach that Jesus is Lord. So, the message of Peter is the message to us. Jesus is Lord. We need to live that way. And I'm on, out of time, almost right on time. So, let me close with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you that you have called us to be your people. That we are your people, your creatures, your very own chosen ones. Help us to live that way. To live like you are the Lord of life. And to boldly share that message to those we encounter around us so that your church can grow in faith in you and in love toward others as you've called us to do it. We pray it in Christ. Amen. And blessings on your day. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beerman. Uh, before you go, before you go, before you go.